Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go live in just a minute or so, giving everybody time to connect. Give it one more minute. I see that the numbers keep coming up. Um, every second, there's a few more people connecting. So we will give it just uh, another 30 seconds or so to give everybody time to connect before we start. And we just got a question asking if there is interpretation in French. No, I'm afraid the event is only in English. But the videos will be available in French. Okay, I think that uh, we can now uh, start our event live. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this uh, very special event. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. If I look at my uh, computer screen here, I see 300 of you connected already, which is a great number to start the day. And of course, you will be following us online from all over Europe. Uh, you can also follow us live on YouTube and you can also view the videos afterwards. Uh, we will give you the link. We have the videos in various languages. We'll give you more explanation about that as we go along. Also, for your information, this event is being recorded. So in case you cannot stay till the end, you can always watch it again afterwards. So we just make sure we're not going to let you off the hook. You are connected, you will see this event. We're live here today from the Press Club in Brussels and we'd like to thank them very much for their hospitality today. And we will also invite you to tweet about the event, hashtag farm to fork paradoxes in one word, F2F paradoxes to the number, number two. So please do take this, meet, this uh, debate to social media. And finally, you will have the opportunity to send us your questions. Our speakers will take your questions as we go. Use the question and answers uh, tag in the platform. So at the bottom of your screen, you have Q&A or Q&R if your screen is in French or any other language. So please send your questions in that particular part of the platform so that we can redirect them to our speakers when the time comes. My name is Florence Ranson and I will be your moderator for this morning. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you on behalf of the two organizers of this event, Carni Sostenibili in Italy and the European Livestock Voice. These two organizations have decided to join forces because they wanted to raise awareness uh, about the way they view farm to fork, the farm to fork strategy launched by the European Commission a few months ago. The two organizations decided to do so in the form of videos, short videos, which they are going to present today and which they're going to be uh, disseminating throughout Europe in the coming weeks. In order to set the scene and uh, put things in the right context, 
I think that we can have a view uh, at the a look at this very first video. It's a short introduction to the whole topic, to the whole issue, and why we're doing this. So let's have a view. Uh, let's have a look at the very first video. The nine paradoxes of farm to fork. At this time, Europe is reviewing its food system and proposing a strategy for transitioning to more sustainable And if you want to production. see the video it is called in full screen, fork. please and it is click part on of a larger speaker and more view. complex plan called the Green Deal. This project contains ambitious and far-reaching targets, but there are also a few paradoxes stemming from the preconception that meat is not sustainable for the environment nor our health. Let's start with a premise. Livestock farms today are very different from once upon a time. They have evolved by learning to use innovation, needing fewer resources and becoming more efficient. But few people are aware of this evolution because over the past decades, farms, once widespread across our continent, have declined dramatically. Today's generation have never experienced the agricultural and livestock world close up, and they often have an idyllic vision of animal farming. The result? We often talk about agriculture and animal husbandry from an urban perspective, far removed from the reality of livestock production and its natural cycles. This is why the farm to fork strategy presents paradoxes. Right, so I think this helped set the scene. And at least now you're probably wondering about those paradoxes. So are we all. So let's dive into the heart of the matter. And for that, I would like to uh, invite Professor Pulina. Professor Pulina is uh, an agronomist by training, and he's also the president of Carni Sostenibili. Professor Pulina, buongiorno. Good morning. Uh, Professor Pulina, can you please explain to us what the goal is behind these videos? What, what, are, you, what are you trying to achieve? Uh, thank you, Florence, for having me this morning. And uh, good morning to everyone that are following us. There are several reasons. Paradox uh, number one. Oh, sorry. This, uh, okay. That's okay. Uh, there are several reasons uh, why we felt to need to create these videos, but mostly we felt to need to show the reality of our sector in view of the farm to fork strategy and to set the record straight about its consequences. Today, 40% of the entire European agri-food market is made up of the livestock sector. It has a value of 170 billion of euros and employs more than 4 million people directly. We therefore feel entitled to intervene in the public debate that is taking place in view of the approval of the Farm to Fork strategy by the European Parliament. Okay, so that really gives us the reason why you've done those videos. But uh, what's the objective of, of the livestock chain, uh, the, the livestock supply chain? What is behind those videos and behind the very uh, approach that you mentioned? Yes, uh, we wanted to create a sustainable food system to continue to guarantee food supply, proper nutrition, food preferences and public health and at the same time protect the environment and animal welfare. Practically, our objectives coincide with the ambitious one of the farm to fork strategy, which aims to create a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system as a part of the broader objective of the Green Deal. However, while we all share these objectives, it appears that the initial formulation of this European strategy involves operational choices that lead to obvious paradoxes. As current plan, farm to fork would make it difficult, if not impossible, to keep the balance between environmental sustainability and food security. Why is that? Why would it make it impossible? 
Yeah, uh, among its objectives, the, the farm to fork proposed by commission includes the reduction of livestock production. We want to show how inappropriate a proposal that is. Today, we want to present to policy makers an appeal based on the description of some of these paradoxes we have identified. The nine paradoxes that we want to highlight are related to nutrition, land use, environment, economy, animal welfare, fertilizers, employment, our gastronomic heritage and food safety. Okay, so that's the list of paradoxes, but uh, concretely speaking, what are they? What, where, do they where do we find them? Yeah, let, let me synthesize uh, some of them, the most uh, significant ones. Uh, we, uh, I start with environment. Uh, today, farmers are increasingly in the eye of the storm due to their supposed contribution to climate change. Yet, uh, data tell us that livestock in Europe is responsible for only 72.2% of emissions compared to the world average of 14.5%. The meat sector alone accounts for around 4% of global greenhouse emissions in Europe. So, wouldn't it be paradoxical to reduce the number of farms and then be forced to import meat for countries that have much less efficient and more polluting farming systems? In addition, Animals are naturally complementary to human life because 86% of their diet is based on plant parts that cannot be digested by humans, such as grass, hay, or crop, or food residues, rich in cellulose. If paradoxically farms disappeared, we would have no to worry about disposing a huge masses of plant residues, which a great impact on the environment and landscape. Another aspect is the European Commission's plans to reduce the use of fertilizers by 20% and increase organic production by 25% by 2030. But the growth organic fruit, grain, and vegetable livestock is needed as their menu allows the soil to be naturally fertilized without the use of chemical fertilizers. So how can we increase aim to organic production without livestock? Right. In terms of, okay. I, 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 please, please continue. No, I, I, I won't speak about economy. It's another paradox. So, right, uh, economy. Uh, the lives of supply chains is one of the most complex and interconnected activities of whole production ecosystem. Primary food products depend on lives of farming, such as milk, cheese, and other dairy products, meat or eggs. However, what people don't remember or don't know is that numerous non-food supply chains also depend on livestock farming. I'm thinking here of products such as hydrolator for shoes, bags, sofas, cars, etc., biomedical capsule from medicine, organic health valves, etc., the cosmetics and the detergent supply chain, cream, soap, etc., the pet food supply chain, organic fertilizers which are also essential for organic farming and agricultural and industrial biomasses necessary to produce renewable energy, such as biogas or biomethane. Right, so you have given us an overview of indeed the environmental and economic impact uh, and, and, uh, and the impact on not only on agriculture, but on the uh, byproducts supply in case we don't have livestock anymore. But what about the impact on other sectors? Yeah, the impact it, of these paradoxes, of course. Yeah, Europe today is one of the largest agricultural producers in the world. The drop in production, inevitable with some farm-to-fork choices, 
will lead to a consequent decrease in global food availability and inevitable increases in the prices of raw materials. This will impact primarily the pockets of European consumers, but the decline in production will also lead to tensions on global prices, paradoxically impacting areas of the world with food supply problems. Right. Right, thank you, Professor Pulina. But, but listening to you, can't Europe do better? I mean, couldn't we do better with less livestock? Yeah, uh, another uh, paradox uh, concerns the use of land and arises from a prejudice. Some claim that farms subtract precious land for human nutrition. Well, that uh, tells us that over the last uh, 60 years, the land used for farming and grazing in Europe has remained constant, while the land covered by forest increased by 8.5 million of hectares. During the same period of time, the population has grown by over 125 million individuals. What do these numbers tell us? That the livestock sector has increased the productivity efficiency without occupying any more land. So clearly, it is not just the livestock sector that is impacted by these paradoxes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pulina, for uh, setting the record straight, as you said yourself in the, in the beginning. I'd like now to turn to our second speaker this morning, um, the representative of the European Livestock Voice, Birte Steinberg. Birte, good morning. Good morning to you and good morning to everybody listening out there. Birte, what's the role of the European Livestock Voice in this whole process, in this whole uh, project? Yes, please let me start by telling a little bit about who we are because uh, we are a quite new uh, multi-stakeholder group of like-minded associations in Brussels. And uh, we went together because we felt that there was uh, a, a need to bring back a more balanced debate about the livestock sector. We present uh, the sectors ranging from animal health to feed and from meat to leather and fur, and also from breeding to animal farming and farmers. And what we really want to do with uh, our multi-stakeholder group is to give some decent and true information about how farming and livestock is produced in the EU as we speak. As we just saw in the introduction video, the farming uh, system has been changed quite a lot in the last 40 years. And uh, when I grew up, I am born in 1965. I'm not proud of it, but that's how it is. When I was a kid, everybody had a connection to a farmer. I had two uncles who were farmers, so I was out there uh, a lot of the time, and I also helped in the stable uh, with different things. That was fine. So, so everybody back then had a connection and knew what was going on. People knew how their food was produced. Then the farm, numbers of farm declined, and uh, a fewer people nowadays have a connection as it was shown in the video. And in the same time, we from the farm and agricultural livestock sector have to admit that we haven't been good at telling the story of the transition. We haven't been good at communicating. And there is a huge communication gap and that's what we are trying to, to, to repair a little bit with the European Livestock Voice. Especially during the last 15 years with the introduction of social media, there's been an even larger gap because there, of course, a lot of people would like to discuss uh, food and agriculture. And uh, we have not been very active in, in, that, uh, in that field. So others have taken over and this has unfortunately, have unfortunately led to a lot of misunderstandings and also myths circling around. So we hope to be able to tell the true fact, facts about livestock production so everybody can make informed choices. And as it says in the very fine uh, banner behind of Florence, it said that we, we, are not, we are not there to try to tell people what to do, what to think, but we would like to give them information so they can make their choices on a more informed basis. This goes for the consumers, 
but it also goes for the politicians. And that's where we come to today's program. Uh, Carnie Sustainability was actually the inspiring factor of the European Livestock Voice. Carnie Sustainability was founded already back in 2012, and they do a fantastic job in Italy. And when we heard about this project making these videos, we contacted them and, and, and asked, can we join in please? And they were so kind and, and let us in, and we have had a great process around it. Um, we all think that we need a change in the way we live in the EU, if we want to deliver a decent planet to the next generations. And therefore, we think that, uh, the, that the Commission has taken the initiative to do something, it's really, really fine. But we would like to be a part of that process. We feel that we haven't really have the possibility to, to speak up and, and to, to tell what we have actually already done in the European livestock sector. Of course, we, we can't just rest on the laurels. We, we still have a lot of work to do, but we have a lot of expertise to provide uh, to the debate and, and to all the analysis that, that is going to be made. And we really would like to be a part of that discussion. So we really hope that the Commission will use us much more, use us, give us questions, give us ta uh, uh, tasks to, to, to do, and we will be a part of the process. So the question's, been, uh, the question's been thrown out there. And if we have people from the Commission uh, listening to us today, uh, I hope they will hear your call. But why now? I mean, it's not new, it's not. So why now in particular? Well, actually right now, um, the farm to fork strategy is debated in the European Parliament. It has already been up in the Agri and Envy Committee. And uh, it's going to be discussed in the plenary uh, in, uh, after the summer break. So we feel that it's a, a really um, urgent to try to, to inform the politicians in the parliament, but also the ones sitting in the council and also the EU officials in the commission, with, with all the, feed them with all the information we have. Because we, we, we have a sense that the debate around farming and agriculture has been a bit emotional rather than scientific. And we feel if you want to make a sustainable uh, policy, then you have to base it on science. And this is what we're trying to, we're trying to bring basis to the, uh, sorry, we're trying to bring science to the forefront of the polit political debate. This week, again, so why do, are we doing it now? This week, it's also Rural Vision Week, and where the Commission aims to uh, meet the challenges and opportunities facing rural areas. And livestock production pre presents a large amount of the total agricultural activity in these areas. So we need to be a part of the discussion. The reality of livestock production needs to be taken into account. Right, so, so we know what your role is and we know why now, but concretely, I mean, Professor Pulina explained why those videos and the broad context. What are you trying to achieve then, producing those videos and disseminating them now and for the future? Well, actually, um, in the climate debate, livestock production and especially meat has become the scapegoat. Professor Polina mentioned uh, some numbers on uh, how the, the livestock sector in the EU, uh, how big a part of the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases the livestock sector has. And everybody, nobody really knows how, how much it is, but they know if, if, if I can do something myself as a consumer to help the climate, then I can stop eating meat. That might not be the best way to, to, to improve the climate. Nobody is talking about that there is huge uh, contributions also from other sectors like transport and energy. And what we like to do is to shed a light on these facts and hopefully give people a more positive look on agriculture and especially livestock. So to see how much this actually contributes to our society because it has a huge uh, contribution. Nowadays, uh, there's a real disconnect between farming and uh, citizens and also politicians. And that's really a, a, a huge uh, mistake and a huge error. As I said before, we can blame ourselves for, for some of it because we have been really bad at communicating and we're trying to, to, to repair that now. 
we're trying to rebalance the, by, the, the debate. So we ask the policymakers to support the role played by the livestock sector and to appreciate the progress that we have already made and to help us make more by using innovation and technology. So innovation and technology are the, uh, are the right ways to go. So with that in mind, what are your next steps then? Well, what we really hope is that we could get involved much more in the current processes so we can uh, achieve an actual balance between environmental challenges, food security and economic sustainability for the rural sector. And with these videos, we launch an appeal to the EU institutions uh, because we really want to establish a more system, systematic dialogue and we really feel we are part of the solution. So please use all the expertise that are in the livestock sector in Europe. Use our inputs so together we can make a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system in the EU. And now I think you should show the rest of the video because it's so great. It's made by Carveni Sostenibili. Thank you, Birte. Thank you. Indeed, I think now we're all very curious to have the detail of these nine paradoxes. So now that we have the context, let's see the actual points made by the two organizations. Paradox number one, nutrition. Science states this clearly. From prehistoric times till today, consumption of animal proteins favors the development of the human brain because, from a nutritional point of view, animal proteins are the most efficient. In a few calories, we find all nine essential amino acids, 16 vitamins and minerals, and 10 bioactive compounds. In other words, if we human beings have become the intelligent and evolved beings of today, we owe it in large part to the omnivorous diet and the nutritious aspects of foods of animal origin. Paradox number two, land use. It is widely believed that livestock takes valuable land away from crops for human consumption, but that's not true at all. In Europe, the land used for farming and grazing has remained almost constant over the last 60 years, while the population has grown by over 125 million individuals and the average lifespan has lengthened by about 10 years, with a life expectancy of almost 80 years of age. Animals are naturally complementary to human life because 86% of their diet is based on plant parts rich in cellulose, such as crop residues, grass, and hay, which are not digestible by people and which are converted into proteins with a high biological value. Paradox number three, the environment. Where there is livestock production, there are people who are invested in protecting the land, avoiding its abandonment, degradation, hydrogeological instability, and loss of biodiversity. Meat is increasingly the scapegoat when it comes to CO2 emissions. But in Europe, livestock are responsible for 7.2% of greenhouse gas emissions, which are already more efficient today than the world average of 14.5%. Where does the remaining 85 to 90 percent come from? Much of global warming comes from the use of fossil fuels. To produce energy in industry, the residential sector and transport. A return flight from Rome to Brussels emits more CO2 per passenger than moderate consumption of meat for a whole year for that same person. Paradox number four, economy. The farm-to-fork strategy hints at a progressive downsizing of the European livestock sector. This could lead to importing meat from other countries, where production has a greater impact on the climate. Emissions know no boundaries, so global air pollution would increase. And the economic impact of imports also needs to be accounted for. Furthermore, the livestock sector is interconnected with dozens of other sectors. Reducing this sector also means putting other sectors in crisis. Paradox number five, animal welfare. European legislation on animal welfare is one of the most advanced and comprehensive in the world. If we stopped raising livestock in Europe and imported meat from other countries, we would have to ask ourselves, would animal welfare be protected? Paradox number six, fertilizers. The European Commission plans to cut fertilizers by 
and to increase organic production by 25% by 2030. But to grow organic vegetables, livestock is needed. Manure allows the soil to be fertilized without the use of chemical fertilizers. Less livestock means less natural fertilizers, more chemicals and more desertification. Paradox number seven, employment. On average, each livestock farm guarantees seven jobs in rural areas. Without farms and with the consequent depopulation of agricultural areas, new job losses would occur. Paradox eight, culinary and cultural heritage. The goal of the farm to fork strategy is to create shorter supply chains and strengthen the resilience of regional food systems, such as geographical indications. This objective clashes with the globalization of ultra-processed and synthetic food made with no territorial identity or cultural heritage. Paradox number nine, food security. With the COVID-19 crisis, the issue of food security is once again in Europe's headlines. We are all quite suddenly more vulnerable. According to the FAO, over the next 30 years, we will have to feed over 2 billion more people. Furthermore, in 2050, about 70% of the world's population will live in cities and urban areas, and a small percentage of the population will have to manage agricultural production. What would happen if animal production and therefore related agricultural activity continued to reduce? We would have less food to eat, and this would generate social chaos. The debate right now seems to be riding an emotional wave, and this is very dangerous. Only science can help us understand how to truly organize sustainable production on a global scale, but one that guarantees food for all. Faced with this scenario, it is more reasonable to appreciate and support livestock farms rather than denigrate them. For these reasons, we appeal to the European institutions. Europe has a great opportunity to use the Green Deal to appreciate the progress made by its agricultural and livestock systems. It would be unforgivable to waste this advantage. The future lies in innovation and technology to produce more with fewer resources. The livestock system is ready to play its role. We ask the European institutions to involve in the decision-making process all professionals and experts in the sector who, without ideologies but with their own skills, can facilitate the transition towards a balance between environmental and economic sustainability. Thank you very much. I think that indeed that uh, answered quite a few of the questions that many of you in the audience may have had. Um, these videos will be available as of now, as of midday today, in seven languages. So, of course, in Italian and in English, as you have just seen, but they will also be available in French, German, Spanish, Portuguese and Polish. Maybe we will be able to have some other language versions in the future, but at least now you will be able to see them from the websites of various organizations in your countries. Uh, we can actually provide the list later on on our websites. You will also be able to find them, find them on the websites of Carni Sostenibili and the European Livestock Voice and on YouTube as well. We will, of course, also be using them on uh, social media in the coming weeks. So there will be plenty more opportunities to uh, see them and go through them in detail. So now I see that we have received quite a few questions from our audience. And I will ask our two speakers to uh, stand ready to answer them. Let me go through some of them. Um, maybe I can start with some that I received in the beginning, um, Birte, there was a, a question that we got asking uh, about the study produced by the US Department of Agriculture. 
they published a study uh, showing the negative economic impact of farm to fork uh, on the European agriculture uh, sector, but also on the rest of the world. And they claim in that study is that uh, farm to fork will generate tensions on the prices of raw materials and it will worsen food security. Now, do you know of a similar study, similar impact study that uh, could have been carried out by uh, the European Commission? No, and that is actually a really, really big puzzle to us. How can it be that the European Commission has not made a cumulative impact assessment, that's what we like to call it, because they have launched really many initiatives and uh, each initiative will have an impact on the other. So you can't just make an impact assessment of one initiative and then another on a second and another on a third. You have to see it all as a whole. And that's what they have tried to do at the USDA. Uh, and the commission has not come up with such an impact study. And we simply cannot understand why. And we urge the commission to do so. And we are not the only ones. The parliament has also, especially in, in the discussion that's been made in the Agri and Envy Committee, asked for this. And just uh, this week in the council, it was also from a number of member states asked, well, why are we not having such a cumulative impact assessment? We have to base our future policies on, uh, on, on, on a, uh, some facts uh, about how it will influence the whole system. So. Really, we, we, we encourage the Commission to make such a cumulative impact assessment as soon as possible. Thank you. And we got another question uh, from um, a press agency for you, Professor Pulina. Yeah. Uh, you said in your, uh, in your answers to my original questions that the part of soil used for breeding has been stable for the last 60 years, despite an increase in production. And the Commission, for its part, says that the share of livestock uh, land or land used for livestock breeding is 68% of all the land used for agriculture. Now, shouldn't this enormous share of land be reduced? Okay, thank you for the, uh, the questions. Uh, and I can clarify this point. That is the head of the uh, paradox number two. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we use uh, uh, the 68 percent of the 160 million of hectares, that is the agricultural um, land uh, in Europe, for livestock. But uh, more or less uh, 40 million of hectares are used for cereals uh, that are cultivated extensively and uh, seed oils. And the remainder, 70 million of hectares, are pasture, meadows, and if we abandon uh, farming, uh, we have uh, to transform the pasture and meadows in cultivated land. So we will have a big impact on the environment because the uh, principal impact is the reduction of biodiversity. The second impact that we lose the carbon that is stocked in the soil. And uh, we have a re reduction of the uh, availability of uh, um, food of animal origin that uh, we have to uh, substitute with food of uh, ve uh, vegetable food that uh, uh, we have to produce more to have the same contribution to uh, nutrition quality of our diet. Thank you very much. I just have a little problem. I seem to have I seem to have lost my connection to the questions. So, um, yes, I've lost the, I'm awfully sorry about this. If my colleagues could uh, give me the text of the questions because I have lost the connection and 
Yeah. So some yeah. question uh, about. Uh, um, yeah, you can see you you can actually Professor Pulina and Birte, yeah. you can see them on the uh, on the discussion. There we are. I'm I'm back online. So good. Now I can see the questions okay. again. There we are. So we had um, a question like for some reason. There we are. I can see the. Um, I'm sorry. It's just for okay. some reason Maybe I don't. In the meantime, uh, you can you can I see them you? actually. You can you can yes. see the questions in the uh, on on the yes. right hand side. In yes. they didn't come through questions yes. and answers. They came through the discussion. But it's the same. You can so if you want to take yes. the first questions while I try to reconnect. Uh, Birte or Professor Polina. Don't worry. Good. Thank you. There is a question on how can we reduce antimicrobial resistance and antibiotic use by 50%, which is a very important goal, uh, and which uh, such uh, restrictive goals with such restrictive and costly registration system for alternative additives in uh, the EU, how to control in this respect quality and safety of animal products imported into Europe? It's a very broad question. I, I might take the first part of it. How can we reduce the use by 50%? Well, actually, the use of antibiotics in the uh, livestock sector has already gone quite heavily down. And uh, of course, therefore, it's very important for us how the baseline is set on this, uh, on this very topic. Uh, because uh, we, we don't want to punish the front runners who have already reduced uh, the use of, uh, of uh, antibiotics quite heavily. Just one example, I represent, I'm a secretary general of the poultry sector and in Italy the antibiotic use in poultry have been reduced with 82 percent during the last five years and that's just one example there are other many other good examples from other european countries so we are on the right track when it comes to reducing antibiotics and it's also a very important thing i'm an educated as a veterinarian and i really it lies very close to my heart we need to reduce the use of antibiotics to be able to have antibiotics to our children for our children and grandchildren but we are really on a good path there and um, maybe uh, Professor Polina, um, how maybe you could uh, reflect a little bit on how can we control this in the products that we import into Europe? Yeah, uh, I think that uh, the European uh, controls are quite strict, oh, yeah. and uh, we can impose uh, an agreement with our. Uh, partner, international partner, to reduce the use of antibiotics, but it is quite difficult to control. And uh, uh, we do the control in the food, of course, uh, of uh, animal origin. And uh, uh, the situation uh, is uh, that uh, only a 0.2% uh, uh, is uh, positive. In that, in that control. So uh, we are sure that uh, the, uh, our meat, milk and eggs are safe in, in, this, uh, in this case. But uh, I think that uh, we can improve uh, the, uh, our situation in reducing use of antibiotics by uh, improving the biosecurity of the farmers first Second, uh, uh, monitoring the health of the, uh, our animals uh, by biotechnology, precision farming, uh, and introducing the precision veterinary uh, practice in our, uh, in our farms. So we have reduced uh, by 39% uh, the use of antibiotics by the 2010, and we uh, can reduce more than 50% because this, the, the, the goal is 50% of the uh, nowadays consume of antibiotics. We done in the past 10 years more than to be able to do in the next 10 years. I, I totally agree with you, Professor Polina, and uh, just a little peep from, from, from the veterinary medicine side. Have we seen the same results in the human sector? Yep. Question mark. Okay, uh, are you back on track, Florence? I am, yes. 
I am. So, um, yeah, now we had a question about uh, organic farming. Uh, how can we increase the share of organic farming, which is statistically associated with lower yields, um, assuming that the population will continue to increase? And as we can read in one of the documents, uh, I guess from the Commission, 33 million people in the EU cannot afford a wholesome meal every day or every second day. So a very ambitious goal is being set to reduce the use of pesticides. And at the same time, uh, it is stated that the use, uh, that uh, climate change brings new threat to plant health. So how do we reconcile all that? More organic farming, uh, better plant health, and at the same time, uh, keeping the same uh, number of animals. I think that's basically what this question is uh, uh, summing up. Would you like me to start? Because then I would be happy to. Um, Please do. Um, the, the, the very honest answer is, I don't know. And <laughs> that's why we really feel that we need a cumulative impact assessment to have all these things revealed. And there is one thing I really would like to say here, and that is um, I have seen in many, many uh, documents and reports and that, that you put organic uh, almost equal, equalizes sustainable. And um, that is simply not how I see it. I buy organic products, I like the concept, it's fine. But sustainability for me is uh, so much more uh, than, than organic. It is, uh, because if you produce, for instance, I know the chickens, so that's why I talk about them. If you want to produce an organic chicken, you need to use more water, you need to use more feed. So it, it, it has a higher climate impact to produce an organic chicken. Then there are some animal welfare things where, where you can say that that runs a little bit in the other way. So, but you have to find uh, the balance uh, so to, to, to find out how to make both the environment happy and the food security system happy and also the affordability. Because as you said, uh, there's, there are many people in the EU and in the world who can't afford uh, these, these products and uh, we, we, we need to find out how, how to do that in a proper way because we need uh, segmentation so there is organic products for the people who uh, are able to and want to buy them, that's fine, but we also need some good and high quality products for the people who might not be as fortunate as the ones buying organic. Thank you. Professor Pulina, would you like to add something? No, I totally agree with uh, Beth. Uh, I, I, I will uh, uh, um, join some concept about the uh, uh, digital uh, transition because uh, with the digitalization of our farm uh, can help us to use less and produce more. And uh, if we uh, intensify some, uh, some chain, uh, we can uh, uh, set aside land to renaturalization and to have more uh, land used for carbon sequestration. So uh, extensivization, I think, is not a good idea in this moment. Thank you. We have another question from uh, Rachele Samo from Sputnik in Italy. What are you going to do if the Commission is not going to talk to you uh, or with you? Uh, what are your future steps? Well, um, we are sure that the Commission is going to talk to us. But of course, we are also in uh, uh, close c uh, contact with the, the European Parliament. And I know for sure that there are quite a few people from the European Parliament uh, watching us here today. And uh, we are going to take even more contact with them. But also the Council. Uh, our members uh, in, in the Association from the European Livestock Voice, we are all umbrella associations for uh, national associations in all of the EU member states. And these uh, associations are also doing a great job in informing their national governments 
on how they see uh, the farm to fork and the Green Deal, how they, we can make it a fantastic opportunity for the EU to create a really good and fair and healthy food system for the future. But we need to take in all aspects and also all the good experiences that we have from the livestock and the farming side. Professor Pulina. Oh, hi, I have not uh, to, 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 to say other things than uh, We are not a political uh, uh, association. We are a cultural association of profit, uh, and uh, our goal is to inform on uh, science-based fact, and that we have not uh, direct contact with the Commission. Okay, and we have another question here. Uh, what do you think about feed additives able to reduce the methane emission in cattle and increase the productivity in meat and milk? The use of these additives could help to reduce the environmental impact of cattle. Could it? Yes, yes, I, 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 I know uh, there are several studies that are exploring the use of algae or other, um, other additives to reduce methane emission. And uh, uh, the, the problems are, are, are good. Uh, we can uh, uh, cut for 20, 25 percent of that emission. But I have uh, to uh, explain that methane is not uh, uh, the same carbon that the CO2 emitted by the transport or, or by cement or, or other stuff uh, that they use for soil carbon. Because methane that are emitted from animals are a biogenic carbon and uh, is uh, into a recycle of the carbon by animals, plants, soil and animals. So uh, if you uh, use a reduction of uh, uh, um, methane emission that stay in atmosphere for 10, 15 uh, years, and CO2 stay in the atmosphere 4,000 of years, you can reduce uh, the, uh, the impact of the CO2 because the CO2 is absorbed by the grass, the plant, and the use of animal in the cycling. This is a uh, uh, Milhoner uh, work, Milhoner is a colleague that work in, uh, uh, in California, uh, Ukraine University, and uh, uh, this uh, paper show clearly that uh, methane is, is part methane of um, ruminant is part of the solution of climate change. Birte, would you like to add something? Uh, I think Professor Pavlina did an excellent job, and and I know most about poultry, and there's not that much methane involved there. So no, thank you. <laughs> Right, we have another question here um, to both of you. Uh, what do you think the proposed EU animal welfare label, uh, or how do you think that uh, animal welfare label proposal will impact farmers? And how will it contribute to the goal of creating a level playing field? Well, um, let me start by saying that um, the EU as is one of the few areas in the world where we actually have legislation on animal welfare. I don't know if everybody is aware of that, but in many other uh, parts of the world, uh, animal welfare is only something that you look upon on voluntary schemes. We have legislation on animal welfare and it's based on science, on advice from EFSA. The animal welfare legislation is, is going to be um, uh, evaluated during the farm to fork process, which I think is really, really fine. Science evolves and we should look at uh, what we can do better. That's really, really fine. When it comes to animal welfare labeling, um, it might be a good idea some, in some places, it might not be such a good idea in others. And for, for what from us, it's really, really important that it's seen in, in, in context with sustainability labeling. Because as I, I touched upon before, sometimes animal welfare and sustainability is not all following each other. So, so you have to, to, to find a balance. And I can only say that, that uh, in Europe, uh, the conventional production is criticized very heavily by many people. But if uh, the EU law is complied with, then the animal welfare is okay 
because it's based on science and uh, we are going to, as I said, uh, it's going to be evaluated and maybe it's going to be changed and uh, because we know a bit more and that is fine. But we have legislation on animal welfare, so we are okay when it comes to animal welfare. Professor Fulina, do you have another take on that? Yes. Yes, no, I, I totally agree that uh, labeling welfare is, is right, but uh, we shall overcome the legislation because I know directly a lot of farmers that they love the animals. They use welfare as a positive act because uh, without animals we have not farmers. So, uh, over the legislation that is strict, uh, as I uh, say before, uh, we are sure that our farmers are in, in, in use all room of welfare because they take care for animals. Exactly. Uh, right. they, and also many times, sorry Florence, but, but I mean uh, animal welfare is also, it, it sounds horrible, but it's also market driven because you actually, you get a better uh, revenue of what you produce if you treat the animals uh, right. So, so uh, if, if you're not treating uh, a cow or a pig or a, a chicken right, then it's not going to give you the profit that you would love it to do. So. There we are. And as Professor Polina said, when you become a farmer, you do it because you love the farming side, you love the animals. So yeah, that's it. Thank, both, thank you both of you. Um, one final question, because we are nearing the end of our allocated time and we do have quite a few questions. Uh, we will, to, to, to the audience out there, we will record these questions and we will try to get back to you maybe in writing between us. We'll share the questions, but we'll try and make sure all the questions are answered, if not now, live in the coming days uh, via email or somehow. So we will get back to you. So one final question here uh, to continue on the uh, animal welfare point. In terms of the animal welfare paradox, have you considered any other measures or reason for a change in the approach of farm to fork that addresses problems associated with confinement farm, uh, confinement farm animal production systems? such as the increased use of alternative, semi-intensive, extensive livestock farming systems, uh, multi-purpose land use, and so on. Well, yes, uh, we, we, we already touched a bit up on this, uh, that by saying that segmentation, of course, is necessary. Uh, we, 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 there, there, there will be a market, I, 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 I'm sure, for, for, for products that organic products for, for free range, for, for whatever. And of course we should provide that, definitely. Uh, but but uh, if, we, if we go over only to use these systems, then I am afraid that the, there's going to be a problem with the food security. So, so uh, that's why again, a cumulative impact assessment where we have these things uh, studied uh, quite well would be a really good idea. Professor Pulina? Okay, I think that there is a little bit confusion between uh, uh, confinement and uh, uh, permanently confined animals. All farm animals are confined. There are fences in the, in the field, so all animals stay into the farm, cannot go outside the farm. When they are permanently confined, they have they can have a space to move, to, to, to have the, the, the freedom to move, to, uh, to do their, uh, their natural uh, behavior. And I think that the semi-extensive uh, um, choice depends on the, the quality of the land. If you have a rich land uh, and you can produce a lot of forage there, you cannot uh, uh, come back uh, by transforming this uh, productive land in pasture to, uh, to allow the, the, the cow to grade this land and reduce the production per cow per hectare. 
So I think that is a choice uh, that uh, is uh, uh, a part of a strategy of the entrepreneur that can choose that what they want to uh, achieve in their strategy of, of, of farming. I think that the, 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 the health problem is to respect animals in all kinds of livestock farm. Thank you very much. Well, while you have the floor, Professor Pulina, I'm going to ask you to give us one or two concluding sentences very quickly. Okay, I, I ask for the European Commission to hear the voice of the farmers. That's short and to the point. Birte, what's your concluding words? Well, it's difficult to come after Professor Polina because he was so very precise. But I really, really hope for, our, for everybody's sake, especially my children and hopefully grandchildren in a few years, that we manage all together to have a fantastic dialogue around these things so we together can make a good plan for a, a good food system for the future because in the process we are in now it's sort of like we're sitting in two ditches shouting at each other and that's not going to help let's talk let's find out what we would we have to make compromises all of us but i'm sure that we can if we go together and help each other can make a really good future for our European food system, which produces the food of the highest quality in the world. Thank you, Birte. And thank you, all of you, for following us this morning. I could see that at some point there were over 400 of you connected to this debate. So we're delighted and we hope that uh, the, uh, the words of our two uh, organizing uh, uh, organizations uh, have been have been heard. Um, thanks a lot to both our speakers as well. A uh, quick reminder, don't forget to look again at the videos, to check them out on YouTube, on the websites, in the various languages that you're interested in. You will receive a, um, a follow-up email uh, probably tomorrow with links to the videos and the main highlights. Uh, I'd like to thank the Press Club for their hospitality again. Thank our colleagues of the uh, technical team behind us for helping us put this together. And the teams at European Livestock Voice and Carni Sostenibili for making this possible. So, ladies and gentlemen, have a very nice rest of the day. And most of all, stay safe. <laughs>